So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about BPH and prostate cancer. So first of all, we realize that a lot of men who have prostate cancer also have large prostates, and we talked um, about how this affects PSA. But overall, how does BPH and prostate cancer work together? Does that confuse treatment options? What does that landscape look like? Well, for some reason, actually I think for reasons we understand well, uh, it's not at all uncommon for men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer to discover also that they have an enlarged prostate. And we know that as men get older, their prostates get bigger, and that as men get older, they catch more prostate cancer. So those things do kind of go in parallel. But there's a uh, deeper connection because bigger prostates, as we've discussed in other videos, make more PSA. And when you have a high PSA, you get more biopsies. And when you do more biopsies, you end up uh, diagnosing more uh, low-grade prostate cancers. So it's true that men that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, on average, will probably have a bigger prostate than uh, men who haven't been diagnosed with prostate cancer. So this is a very common problem. And, and the, uh, the issue with having an enlarged prostate has ramifications for treatment. For example, um, really big prostates sometimes present a bigger challenge in treatment compared to a smaller prostate, at least when you try and treat the whole prostate, which is the standard approach. And uh, on the other hand, a big prostate may be advantageous if someone is thinking of doing focal treatment. So if you have a larger gland and you want to treat a section, that gives you more margin if there's a larger, plumper prostate uh, where you're just subselectively treating one area of the prostate. And then I, I think one thing I'd like to mention, and I hope a message that can get across clearly to everyone, is that prostate cancer per se doesn't have symptoms, whereas enlarged prostates, overactive bladders, and all these urinary problems that can come along with a big prostate almost always do have symptoms. And, uh, and people tend to kind of connect the two together. They, they're wondering if the discomfort they have in their pelvis or the urinary frequency or the getting up at night has something to do with cancer getting worse. And the answer is unequivocally not. Prostate cancer uh, was such a silent disease, it was a real scourge until PSA was invented in the 1980s. And we finally had a window into who, has, who might have cancer and who might not have cancer. Uh, up to that time, men were coming into the doctor's office w uh, with cancer that had spread outside the gland, and when they did PSAs in these unfortunate individuals, uh, they would be in the hundreds. So men that are routinely checking their PSA and have relatively reasonable levels of PSAs less than 10, it's essentially impossible for cancer to be causing a symptom. So when we talk about symptoms, it's a, t a totally separate issue compared to the cancer process which is only monitored with PSA or biopsies or imaging. Symptoms come from either big prostates or overactive bladders or inflamed prostates, uh, all major issues, but thankfully nothing related to cancer. So from the ground up, how does BPH, like how is it diagnosed? Is it through a scan? Is it a digital rectal exam? Well, BPH stands for benign prostatic hypertrophy, which means a big gland. And it's kind of a grab bag term that covers this whole issue. Uh, are you having any problems with your urinary function or are you having any discomfort down in your pelvic region? The uh, underlying issue could be due to the enlargement of the prostate pushing on the urethra, the urinary passage that goes through the middle of the gland. People also have symptoms when they have uh, overactive bladders, uh, uh, inflamed prostates we call prostatitis. And uh, not to confuse matters further, you can have all three. You can have a big prostate, you can have an overactive bladder, and you can have an inflamed prostate at the same time. The uh, idea of what is BPH is oftentimes hard to define. And uh, the, to summarize how people treat this, doctors think about it, it's usually through a process of trial and error, of trying this treatment, trying that treatment, and trying to help men come back to a reasonable quality of life. So we're treating symptoms Oftentimes, we may not be fixing the problem. We're just controlling symptoms so that people can uh, enjoy a livable lifestyle. So if a person is diagnosed with prostate cancer and then they have BPH, do you need to get the prostate to become smaller for treatment to happen? Like, is there certain treatments where a large prostate, is, it's not possible? Um, the radiation therapists tell me that they don't like to treat prostates that are over 100 cubic centimeters. So 40 being the average, you're looking at men that start passing the threshold of you know, twice as big as an average prostate or three times as big as an average prostate. So the radiation therapists then are radiating a larger field and then you, uh, by 
treating bigger bigger areas with radiation, you're going to have uh, potential for more side effects. So they do tend to prefer the idea of starting on some testosterone blockade, hormonal therapy, Lupron, to shrink the prostate for a couple of months and reduce the size of the target and thus limiting to some degree the potential side effects of radiation. Another major concern, of course, if people have a lot of pre-existing urinary symptoms, which may be due to the large prostate or overactive bladder, who knows, underlying prostatitis, um, those symptoms can certainly get worse with radiation, especially in the short term. That has to be also uh, uh, assessed in someone that is contemplating radiation. Are they likely to need some sort of an intervention to help their urinary function in the future? If that's the case, you really wanna do that intervention prior to radiation. One of the problems with radiation long-term is that the prostate tissue doesn't heal as well if you radiate it, laser it, um, whatnot, and the body remembers that radiation forever. So if men have a large prostate that uh, people anticipate will present problems with urinary outflow problems in the future, then uh, it might be good for them to consult a urologist, have that extra tissue removed with a transurethral section, something of that nature, uh, prior to undergoing radiation. Uh, that prostate will heal better before the radiation than it would after the radiation. You mentioned consulting with the urologist for these interventions. Besides a TERP, like what else would a patient be getting possibly? Um, there's a lot of things that are being done now. Uh, Transurethral sections, as you mentioned, are done with a, with a knife. Uh, lasers, these are all ways to open up the urinary passage. Uh, Urolift, uh, prostate embolization, uh, aqua ablation, resume. There's a number of different ways to try and open up the urinary passage. And uh, the thinking is that if uh, the doctors are projecting that this will become a problem down the line, that it may be better to do it before the radiation treatment is performed so that the tissue can heal up normally and not take the chance of a poor healing situation that might occur if you did the same procedure after the radiation. So how is the need of opening up those urinary passageways determined like before a patient would get radiation? Is it on a scan? Is it maybe the patient's having symptoms? What does that look like? It starts with uh, taking a history and finding out symptoms. There's a questionnaire called the uh, AUA symptom score uh, questionnaire where you uh, basically describe the, the urinary habit patterns that the individual has. And you can see this thing which scores people from like uh, 5 up to 25 with higher scores suggesting greater problems. Uh, you'll be able to see right away that this might be a potential problem if you add additional layers of radiation on top of it. There's a whole diagnostic process in terms of uh, 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 checking the bladder to make sure it truly empties after people believe they've emptied their bladders. Um, they can do flow studies to make sure that the rate of urinary flow is adequate. That in combination with the, his the historical questions that we've already um, put to the patient will help us understand if this is someone that's already teetering on the edge and then maybe it's going to end up with greater problems if they have radiation. So, Dr. Scholz, I know you're not a huge fan of surgery, but I've heard that that's one way of improving urinary flow. So what does that look like as far as when a patient's trying to decide on treatment, if they have a large prostate, wouldn't that help? So the urologist uh, will position the, the radical prostatectomy as sort of a you know, two-for-one option for men that have big prostates and a lot of pre-existing urinary problems. And uh, by removing the prostate, they are correct that uh, that will uh, allow free f flow of urine and... Um, and certainly can be a good fix for this problem. It doesn't usually uh, persuade me to steer people towards, um, uh, towards doing surgery, as it seems to me too high a price of pay to solve the urinary problems, which can be solved through medications or other means, when we know that you know, one of the main problems with surgery is too much urine flow. We call it incontinence. So a certain percentage of men will be leaking urine continually, uh, others Many as 50% of men that have radical prostatectomies will have stress incontinence. So when they laugh, jump, cough, they're going to squirt a little bit of urine. So there is truth to the matter that uh, the BPH problems do get solved with, um, uh, with uh, radical prostatectomy. And unfortunately, the radical prostatectomy has other negative uh, aspects that I find uh, unacceptable and believe that the other methods that we have for managing enlarged prostates with medications or other interventions are uh, more than adequate. 
Thank you so much for watching everyone. First of all, I want you to know that PCRI is extremely passionate, not just about your prostate cancer education, but also empowering you to make the best decisions for your quality of life. The more information you have, the more you are prepared for unexpected moments along your journey, and we wanna help you do that. There's a whole host of support systems out there from support groups to advocacy organizations that focus on very specific services for you, financial aid, and so much more. You can visit our website, pcri.org for more information, and don't forget, subscribe to our YouTube channel because we come out with new prostate cancer videos and men's health videos every week.